In 2012, players were thrilled to play a new Assassin's Creed game and experience the American Revolution as the badass assassin that they'd seen in the trailers and merchandise, only to be left in shock as they spent the first quarter of the actual game before that character was even born, as a completely different character that wasn't alluded to or mentioned in the marketing material but was now your protagonist for the next three to four hours of the game. Half of these players grew frustrated and aggressively powered through the story to get to sequence six, when they could finally play it as Connor and live out the fantasy that the game had promised. However, the other half, despite feeling cheated, embraced the idea of a slower paced narrative, held together by a perspective that was both engaging and mysterious, as the game slowed down and built up the characters and conflicts at play that would later be explored in depth. Suffice to say, these opening hours were a bold approach to storytelling, especially for a video game where players want to dive straight into the action. The secret glue that holds the opening hours of AC3 together all boil down to one character. For the first time in the series, players are treated to a different perspective, playing as a Templar, building up a team that would later become your targets. You just didn't know it yet. However, outside of this change, the characters still needed to be engaging and hook the player's attention, which this one certainly did, prompting a novel and appearances in future games as a result of the characters' overwhelming success and popularity in the fandom. Of course, I'm referring to the Grand Master of the Colonial Rite, Haytham Kenway. Haytham subverts the expectations of what a protagonist can look like in the series, giving us a morally grey, yet witty character you can't help but love. He may not be an assassin, but he stands to this day as the most recognisable and favourite villain of the series, and a character that warrants a full deep dive. With that said, welcome back to my Assassin's Creed character study series, where we take a deeper look into the protagonists of Assassin's Creed. So far, we've had a look at Ezio, Edward, Arno, Connor, Jacob, Evie, Lydia, Altair and Shea, with a detour looking at Freedom Cry, the Tyranny of King Washington and the Jack the Ripper expansions. If you're new to the series and want to check out the previous entries, the card is on screen now for you to take a look, and don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future uploads. I'm currently doing a series that takes the character and design section of these videos and expands them into their own series, analysing and ranking all of the unlockable outfits in each game, which you won't want to miss. Speaking of which, we'll start by looking at the character and design, the story and setting, and finally conclude with my thoughts on how the character was implemented. When I carried out my study on Connor, I skipped over the first three sequences of AC3 until Connor appeared, Today, we're going to fill in those blanks, looking at Haytham's appearances in Assassin's Creed 3, both the 1750s section and the 1770s section, and his reappearance in AC Rogue, using the Assassin's Creed Forsaken novel as a reference throughout. The Forsaken novel tells the events of Haytham's life leading up to the events of AC 3, his early years and what led to him becoming a Templar. The novel does take some deviations from what we see in-game, so I'll point out any particular changes the novel makes along the way, as we discuss the impact these changes have on how we perceive Haytham. In both my Connor and Shea videos, I did refer to Haytham, however this video will revisit some of those moments through the lens of Haytham, so if you feel like I'm missing some part of an interaction, check out my Shea and Connor videos, as I go into more depth on their side of things in those videos, which can help build a full picture of my thoughts. With that out the way, let's begin. Just north of here is where we normally unload the cargo. Maybe you'll find it there. Not that. Born in 1725 in the heart of London, Haytham Kenway was brought up by his father, former pirate and master assassin Edward James Kenway until he died in 1735, when Haytham was only 10 years old. Before his death, Edward had wasted no time in preparing Haytham for the world outside, training him with a sword at only 6 years old. Whilst this training was taking place, the Kenways were often visited by Reginald Birch. 
Birch would later be revealed to be a Templar, who took Hirtham under his wing and trained Hirtham as a Templar following Edward's death. Initially hoping to unite the Assassins and Templars using his heritage and beliefs, Hirtham may have risen to the rank of Grand Master, but he always retained a greyness regarding the Assassin and Templar conflict. Hirtham took a more proactive approach than other Grand Masters, and wouldn't hesitate to engage in fieldwork if needed. Hirtham lived and died through his endless pursuit to fulfil the Templar's vision, and his ideals for others. Despite Hirtham's upper-class exterior with his received pronunciation and sarcastic wit, he was a great lover of people, not just the lower class, but believed wholeheartedly in humanity, and that they only sought direction and purpose to survive in the long run. Charismatic, erudite and level-headed, Hirtham's reign as Grand Master brought the successful purge of the North American Assassins, thanks to his steady guiding of Sheer Cormac, and preventing the Assassins from obtaining the precursor artefacts which kept them at bay. In his later years, Hirtham stepped back from the spotlight in a plot to replace George Washington with Charles Lee, becoming colder and more ruthless. Hirtham grappled with the notion of ending his son Connor's life on multiple occasions, yet a clandestine search of newfound parental love and responsibility, coupled with a yearning for his son to have a brighter, more successful future, ultimately stays his hand. Hirtham lost his cool when Connor severed their connection after a confrontation with Washington, regarding the fate of Connor's village as a child, only yielding when faced with his demise. Despite his deep affection for his son, Hirtham's allegiance to the Templar cause compelled him to safeguard it against Connor. In the aftermath of Hirtham's passing, Connor, in spirit of compromise, acknowledges his father's perspective on the inherent flaws of humanity. However, he opted to retain a hopeful belief that despite these imperfections, humanity could evolve for the better. In terms of design, let's look at Hirtham's appearance during the events of Assassin's Creed III and Rogue. Starting with a general overview, Hirtham being a Templar means that his design philosophy is much more aligned with their characteristics. However, to emphasise the conflict Hirtham has inside, he bears the noteworthy assassin insignia, and other familiar imagery to lull the players to think at first that they were playing as an assassin, before the reveal of his Templar allegiances. Hirtham wears a large overcoat that fits his pragmatic and charismatic personality, giving him a dashing appearance. He sports long-tied hair with a dash of red at the back, similar to Ezio. Around the time of Assassin's Creed 3, we were also treated to the spin-off game Assassin's Creed Liberation, which had the iconography changed from a hood to a tricorn with a beak, which provided a strategic advantage in recognising an assassin without a hood. Whether intentional or not, it helped to fool the masses into thinking that Hirtham was an assassin, because he too sported a tricorn. These aren't the only indicators though. The deception continues with an eagle logo on his bracer, and the name Hirtham translating to Young Hawk in Arabic. Confirmed to have been a name Edward chose himself, from reading the scriptures of Hytham, who we would later meet in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, tying Hirtham to the Brotherhood which makes his reveal even more impactful. The final connection Hirtham has to his assassin roots is the inclusion of the hidden blades. In the Forsaken novel, we find out that these blades were acquired after Hirtham was tasked to kidnap a young rebel, but found him protected by an assassin bodyguard. The assassin named Miko lived to fight another day, but Hirtham obtained his blade during the struggle, giving Hirtham a tool from the assassin's side. This shows us early on how Hirtham's character is willing to embrace both sides, and shows hints of unity between the Assassins and Templars. That's not to say the signs weren't there of his hidden allegiance. A staple of the Templar design philosophy is the use of squares and rectangles in the design, bold sturdy shapes that Hirtham's design sports in his midsection. They also have a cross, which is explicitly placed at the top of Hirtham's cape, staring you in the face throughout the entire time you play as him. Hirtham's cape features a very intricate design with royal flourishes and even the Illuminati triangle, and Freemasons logo in the centre, 
to further confuse the player in case they clicked on. Hatham's outfit evokes a sense of conflict with its contrasting assassin and Templar iconography. The design works effectively in aiding the narrative twist at the end of the third sequence, but it also reinforces Hatham's struggle between the assassin and Templar conflict in his later appearances. Though he firmly believes in the Templar cause, the influence of Zeo and his son Connor diverts his attention and makes his character much more than just a typical Templar, one that listens to the opposing side and even has a truce, albeit through familial ties, rather than believing in the ideology of the assassins. But with that opportunity, the chance to bring peace presents itself. Just north of here is where we normally unload the cargo. Maybe you'll find him there. In the closing moments of Assassin's Creed 4, we see Edward Kenway return to England after his time in the Caribbean, now content with riches and a family of his own, and the responsibility to take care of them. At the Opera House we meet a young Hatham Kenway, full of good spirits as he enjoys the performance, however coincidence finds Hatham at the Theatre Royale decades later, as the bridge into AC3 and we are introduced to Hatham properly for the first time. A thousand pardons. My apologies. Through his interactions with the crowd, we can see that Hatham is well-mannered and polite due to his upbringing, but also quite manipulative, and uses his upper-class appearance to his advantage. After being given a target to eliminate, Hatham uses his quick thinking to find a way around the theatre, and infiltrates the booth his enemy is hiding in finding the assassin Miko and killing him with his own hidden blade, so he can retrieve his amulet. A clean job perfectly executed, except for one witness, a scared child who Hatham shushes to silence. If you need any kind of foreshadowing that Hatham was a Templar, this is a pretty prime example. You can even meet this child all grown up later in the game, and recruit him as an assassin where he'll recount this event from his perspective. I was sitting in the balcony with an uncle of mine, went to have a piss, and when I came back, there's your dad. Dashing as they call me was, shirt, jacket, immaculate. My uncle was just slumped there. Looked like he was sleeping, but I knew better, even if I was only a child. Your dad locked eyes on me. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever been so frightened as I was in that instant. It wasn't a fear that he was gonna cause me pain. It was this sense that he, saw right through me, into my heart, and you're a crush it if it had pleased him. But he didn't. He just raised his finger to his lips and gestured for my silence. I complied, and then he was gone. Having this small detail just emphasizes the menace and influence Hatham has on others. We don't often see how the targets' deaths affect the people who witness them, so this detail makes you think more about the lives that are damaged or traumatised by the Assassin Templar War. With the amulet acquired, the Templars believe that this will act as a key to unlock the vault. However, we've seen Desmond unlock this in the present day using the Apple of Eden. Therefore, we will have questions on how the amulet will play into the 1754 version of the temple. Having this simple story for the first three sequences helps make a lot of the scenes elevate Hatham's character instead of being plot heavy, time that pays off later when he reappears. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean, Hatham passes the time by getting into a scrap. The meaning of this? Captain, explain yourself at once, Mr. Kenway. These thought we were simply passing the time with a bit of sport, Captain. How about you pass the time by doing your goddamn jobs instead? I wasn't aware I was paying you to loll about. A word, please, Mr. Kenway. Oh, I nearly forgot. There's your knife back. <laughs> it's fun to see how Hatham reacts when he's challenged by others. Hatham is largely laid back in his general demeanour, but proves to be a slippery and dangerous character when you push him too far. Behind his fun expression, he isn't one to be messed with, but luckily his inclination towards having fun and causing chaos makes him more appealing to the player. With word of mutiny amongst the crew brewing, 
Hitham has already seen firsthand the tension on board, and is tasked to uncover the plot. As this plot unravels, we see it brought to a head with an attack from a pursuing ship. Hitham has been challenged by a lot of the crew members by being upper class, and now the captain joins them by calling out Hitham's inability to work the jobs needed to prevent the attack. The theme of class has been tackled in previous Assassin's Creed games, with Ezio needing to learn essential skills from the lower class in order to survive. However, here it is used more as an obstacle, and as a way of further fleshing out Hatham as a character. In most scenarios, the player would be hostile to Hatham immediately, because of his pompous attitude and wealthy upbringing, so giving Hatham this chance to address those concerns directly and prove his worth is important in making us care for this character as soon as possible. It turns out the mutiny aboard the ship was a trap by the assassins, who were in hot pursuit of Kenway after the Opera House. Instead of being taken in peacefully, Hatham proves to be honourable and skilled in combat, as he duels his assailant and kills him. The captain tries to surrender Hatham to the assassins, and Hatham quickly draws his blade, which leans into an impulsive attitude, which we'll see explored further. Hatham's leading man qualities take control here, and he easily sways the captain to his side, taking command of the ship and escaping his pursuers by taking risks, travelling through a storm. Hatham even brings the criticisms full circle by helping to fix the ropes and other tasks that the crew mocked him for. He saves the crew's lives and successfully escapes, reaching America after a long 72-day voyage. The theme of this setup has been not to judge a book by its cover. Hatham is challenged in many ways that subvert your expectations from your first impressions of him. He may be a cold-blooded killer from a rich upbringing, but he's charming and not snobbish, joking with the crew, getting his hands dirty and saving their lives when called for. He's a natural leader who will go out of his way to help others, hidden behind dry wit and great one-liners. Arriving in America, we meet a charming young man named Charles Lee. You are nothing, a speck of dust. You and all your ilk. <laughs> he's such a f sorry. He's nice. He's a lovely. He's a lovely young gentleman. Uh, he's, a, he's a very kind man. He's, oh, look at him! Bless him. He's so innocent. Living in the dirt like animals. He's heard very highly of Hatham and hopes to serve under him as his apprentice. So in a way. Hatham's traits should carry across to Charles during his time in Boston. Spoiler alert, they do not. The quest begins to gather together all the men that will become essential to completing Hatham's expedition, and to give you people to kill when you play as Connor. William Johnson is already present, and leads you to Thomas Hickey, proving your strategic knowledge by helping him recover Johnson's research. You start to see Hatham's colder persona come to light here, where he speaks down to the guards at the encampment. You've got to applaud how many times they have to dodge saying the name Templar, in some creative and cool ways to preserve the mystery. Who should I say you are? You don't. They'll know. There are moments where Hatham ends up looking better because of the rapidly descending Charles. You don't pick up on it straight away, but their reactions to Thomas Hickey being drunk and disorderly show the difference in the two men's mindsets. Hatham disregards his actions because he's looking at the uses Hickey could have, and not the negatives, whereas Charles judges him too quickly, and this begins to frustrate him maybe even out of jealousy, as we see him getting more aggressive and attempt to take control away. Wonderful. Charles? Sir? Sir? 
only in small moments, but they're still present, and the Forsaken novel leans into this more, to foreshadow Charles' decline. This helps Hatham's character because of just how sturdy he steers throughout this. He doesn't fall like Charles, but steers calm and composed due to his humorous approach to the mission. After gathering his Templar conspirators, with a little complication from Edward Braddock, a man Hatham had worked with under the Templar Order prior, but had lost his way after killing a man's family in cold blood, for no other reason than to fuel his ego and pride. Hatham had been using Charles and John Pitcairn by removing them from Braddock, something that he had not been too kind to hear. Eventually, the team worked together to infiltrate the Southgate Fort. Hatham believes that since the Grand Temple lies within the native occupied forests, the slaves held by the British could lead him to the site if they were freed. Despite doing the right thing by freeing the prisoners, it was done with only selfish intentions, as Hatham hopes the native people will make contact with him to offer their gratitude, and then he could use them to find the site. However, weeks later, he has to seek them out himself. This isn't the only pitfall either, as now Braddock is trying to force Charles back under his service, and Charles is the only one making an active effort to find the Mohawk people. Are you touched in the head? Me? Haytham? I come in peace. Why are you speaking so slow? <sighs> Sorry. What do you want? Well, your name, for one. I'm Gadzi Zio. Well, pleased to meet you. God, God's day. Just call me Zio. Dio. Zio. Zio. After meeting Zio, Hatham is forced to change the way he confronts situations. His wit and charm won't work here, and he can't manipulate her to hurry along the process. She puts him in a situation where he must now do the right thing for the right reasons, even if it's only to serve his own goals in the end. You're hurt. Oh, it's nothing. Here. I should stop the bleeding. That wasn't necessary. But thank you. Hatham's layers begin to unravel when he's around Zeor. Quite quickly, we see how being introduced to a new culture throws off his perception of how to read people, and he instead becomes more honest and open about his feelings, showing empathy and also letting Zeor crack some jokes at his expense. Oi! Where are you going, Cully? Me? No, the other cock robin. Well, I, uh, I was leaving. Oh? And now? Well, now, I'm going to feed you your teeth. And you were worried I was going to be the problem? A few missions later, they uncover Braddock's location and lay a trap. What would you have me do? Yep, that's definitely Connor's father. After splitting up the troops, Hatham chases down Braddock, and Zeo nearly kills George Washington. No, not that time. In Braddock's memory corridor, Hatham explains that this was purely business related. He wouldn't have sought out Braddock if it hadn't helped win Zio's favour, but also that he was a bit of an arsehole and did deserve this at some point. Braddock believes that the British are being too passive and should try to take the land by force instead of negotiating. This does shine a parallel on what Hatham has been doing throughout this sequence. Sequence 2 was primarily achieving the job of setting up the Templars Connor will later kill, demonstrating a few key traits and then moving on to the bigger mission at hand here in Sequence 3. Hatham could have easily forced the location of the site out of Zeo, but instead chose to work with her and build bridges instead of burning them. Braddock would have killed her for the location of the site, but Hatham knows better than to let an opportunity go to waste. We can see here the groundwork for a character that is maybe a little too easygoing and trusting of people, to the point where they get inside his head too quick. Hatham gets a great last line where he shows Braddock's hypocrisy, and uses his logic that nobody should show hesitation in killing to kill Braddock. 
whether we applied the sword more liberally and more often, the world would be a better place than it is today. In this instance, I concur. It's nice that despite Hatham's journey being all for nothing, he doesn't act mean or hostile towards Zeo. He appreciates her help and feels bad about feelings he's developed along the way, because he knows he can't be with her forever. Zeo tells the story of how children carry their legacy, which is a nice way of helping Hatham come to terms with the defeat, and is pretty good foreshadowing. Hatham then meets with the Templars and informs them of the news, before telling them that they'll be staying in America and establishing a permanent base. I think this may have been to spend more time with Zeo, and he did, for the first few weeks before Charles found them, informing Hatham that his sister, Jennifer Scott, had been found after her kidnapping in 1735, causing Hatham to leave Zeo, which left her infuriated and forbade him from returning. However, annoyingly, that part's not in the game. Three years later, after avenging his father and freeing his sister, Hatham would return to America in 1758 to oversee the induction of Shea Patrick Cormac into the Templar Order, leading us to his inclusion in Assassin's Creed Rogue. A lot of the criticisms I have towards AC3 is that it hinges on a story of the father and son. Hatham and Connor should be what is at the forefront of the game, but the game stumbles during the time skip by missing out on key information. We see Hatham and Zeo's blossoming romance, but we don't get to see what caused them to separate, or the reason why, and it's completely glossed over when he reappears when this is crucial information to know. That's why I judge the sections in AC Rogue so much more, because someone must have known that there was a good 20 year gap where Hatham's whereabouts are completely unaccounted for, outside of the Ottoman section in Forsaken. So this could have been the chance to give us those scenes, where Hatham talks about his feelings after leaving Zeo, and his son behind. But let's look at what we do get. The reintroduction to Hatham is very well executed at the ceremony, and feels a bit like a Marvel end credit scene, and seeing Charles in the background is a neat continuity too. Unfortunately, the following scenes with Hatham don't quite live up to his inclusion. There are a few missions where his connections with Captain Cook lead him to be present during the Battle of Louisburg, but he's very passive and doesn't say much outside of exposition. This changes as soon as Adewale enters the picture. Hatham at this point doesn't talk to his sister much, despite saving her fairly recently. The two didn't share very fond memories outside of the traumatic events they'd experienced and this could suggest that Hatham is ashamed of his past. The assassin heritage being denounced adds to this impression, and so the re-emerging of Adewale, the man who brought out the best qualities of his father and led him on the path to becoming an assassin, is a nail in the coffin for Hatham, and will naturally want to snuff out this reminder of his father, so he hunts him down almost obsessively and without remorse. During the scene where you confront Adewale, if you leave him alive a little longer, you'll be treated to unique dialogue between himself and Hatham. Hatham, can we? Adewale. Yeah. Where's your hunting dog, Grandmaster Templar? I must, have caused quite a ruckus for both of you to be chasing. Indeed. You've been a thorn on our side far too long. I serve the father, Hatham. Be ashamed to see what you have become. Really? I wasn't aware my father had a sense of shame. Do not speak of your father, boy. If you become half a man he was, it will be a blessing. Blessing or curse. I am my own man. Hatham being talked down to and on the back foot is something we don't often see, but Adewale is certainly the man to do it. Calling Hatham a boy and how Edward would be ashamed of him presents an opportunity for Hatham to explain what makes him different from Edward. I like that he calls himself his own man. That's such a small line, but it says a lot about how we perceive the bloodlines in these games. That every ancestor must be an assassin, when in reality, how many times do we have the same occupation as our parents? The same beliefs? Hatham was right to lose his father's allegiances and be his own man, 
and shouldn't be talked down to just because Adewale only sees him as an extension of Edward. However, since the assassins in this game are portrayed as terrorists, it does make you question how Edward would have reacted to this encounter. He rarely agreed with Adewale and showed a lot of the same traits as Haytham, so I could see him going either way, which makes this all the more interesting to include. I just wish the presentation was better, as this is dialogue most players will never hear, and it should have been within a cutscene to feel the impact of these two going head to head. Even in the memory corridor, it's all about sheer. Haytham just gets inappropriate. Come. When Shea and Haytham reach the Precursor site, there's this fun bit where Haytham pushes a guy into a laser trap. Nothing particular to comment on here, I just thought it made me chuckle. Oh, and he shoots Achilles, that's also quite important. But it's just little lore details that connect him to more of the overall story, less so character moments. I think there must have been some kind of restriction on how much they could use his character, because his inclusion is painfully safe. There's no real reason for him to be here, as much as I hate to say that, and he doesn't offer anything to the plot, and even the voice actor Adrian Hughes isn't really giving his all when you compare it to AC3. It hurts to say it, but I noticed when I first played the game, bloody hell, nine years ago, that something seemed off about Haytham in this game. The writing isn't as sharp, and he doesn't say much to begin with. It feels like filler or an inclusion that was a selling point, and that's disappointing. His inclusion helps Shea in some ways, which I mentioned in my study on Shea, but if we're looking purely at Haytham, this is bare bones for the character, and proof that sometimes you can't just throw in a legacy character unless you actually have something for them to do. However, that's where Assassin's Creed Rogue leaves us, and brings us back to AC3, nearly 20 years later, with a massive time skip to 1777, where Haytham learns that his son, now all grown up and casually killing his friends, has been locked up in prison after an altercation with Thomas Hickey. Whilst visiting the prison to see Hickey, Haytham got a look at Connor, and could tell from his facial features that he was his son, ordering Charles to deal with him. The longer Haytham thought about seeing Connor, the more he came to regret his decision, and he attended the public hanging of his son and witnessed the assassin recruits under Achilles fail to rescue him by only partially cutting the rope. Haytham saw all of this from the crowd, and in the panic was able to throw a knife at the rope and save Connor's life. This leads him to immediately chase after Hickey and kill him, effectively making Haytham a traitor, which is a massive shift in the dynamic. A year later, supplies are being stolen by Benjamin Church, a Templar recently released from prison which has Connor hot on the trail, investigating the camp where the supplies went missing, only to find someone else. Father. Connor. Any last words? Wait. A poor choice. <laughs> The consistency of Haytham's character is impressive here. He still retains a passive attitude as he's only just stumbled across his son and never made an effort to reach out to him since saving his life back during the hanging. Haytham tends to only make decisions if they're logical and easy to make and never acts out of an emotional weakness which puts him at odds with Connor who will often have emotional outbursts and thinks with his heart instead of his mind. Connor's naivety contrasts with Haytham's cold approach to seeing his son again, as Haytham would rather belittle Connor for the men he's killed and the decisions he's made. He only refers to Connor as his son at the end when he needs to manipulate him into working with him. Perhaps... Perhaps some time together might do us good. You are my son after all, and might still be saved from your ignorance. I can kill you now. If you prefer. Excellent. Shall we be off? The characterization in both the novelization and game differ in the way they show Haytham's empathy at different times. For example, in the novel when Haytham and Connor meet here, it's only when Haytham sees the necklace Connor is wearing and how he is also wearing the amulet that he realized that they were both wearing something with a connection to Zeo 
and although Hatham was still struggling to understand if he loved Zio or not, he chose to do what she would want and try and patch things up with his son. In the game, Hatham appears a lot less interested, and only working for his own goals. However, there is the added context that Hatham in the game thinks that Zio is still alive, and whereas Hatham in the book knew she was already dead, and this context would add to the reasoning for Hatham being sympathetic or empathetic towards Connor. Hatham and Connor then ride off in search of the traitor Benjamin Church. In the novel, Hatham is hiding his admiration of Connor's tracking abilities, whereas we don't see any of this in the game. The novel does do a wonderful job of making Hatham's character more human and sympathetic, and it's in these sections with Connor where these changes in the translation take the forefront and show us a different side to Hatham, one that I think everyone unanimously preferred to his portrayal in the game. Hatham and Connor find one of Church's men, and Hatham excellently demonstrates not putting up with anyone's shit by shooting him. In the novel, Hatham wonders whether he's acting so outrageously because he's trying to show Connor the man he shouldn't become, or if he's teaching him a lesson on how to become less brittle. Later returning to New York, we get this exchange. In Forsaken, Hatham is given the added scenes of saving Connor's life at the hanging, but also in the prison, which Hatham can't quite understand himself. He doesn't know if he's longing for the life with Zio that he never had, or that in his old age, he's gotten soft, but he isn't comfortable talking to Connor about it, or exposing his weaknesses to, who still is, the enemy. The following debate is very telling of Connor and Hatham's characters. They struggle to connect as father and son, but the one thing they can both be connected by is their allegiances to the Assassins and Templars. In this way, they get their most meaningful conversation yet, as they discuss their plans. However, it says a lot that they can't have anywhere near the amount of discussion about their feelings, and find safety in arguing so they can put off having to address their relationship. That's not to say their words are meaningless here, the back and forth between them offer our best insight yet into the philosophy of both factions. Hatham used to agree with the assassins and seeking peace, but under Achilles they have changed their goals to freedom, a sharp difference the assassins are too naive to understand. It doesn't matter what Connor says about Washington, because Hatham already knows the truth about the attack on the village in Forsaken. So whilst in the game their argument is genuine, in the novel, Hatham is only putting off telling Connor the truth. After all, he doesn't want to hurt him more than he already has. As the pair continue, Hatham tries to hint to Connor about the truth of his village's fate. Connor had grown up thinking that Hatham was responsible for the village burning down as a child, when it was in fact Washington. This leads Hatham to use this opportunity to correct this error and begin to change Connor's perception of him. I'm actually curious to know what your mother might have said about me. I've always wondered what life might have been like had she and I stayed together. How was she, by the way? Dead. Murdered. What? I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, you're sorry? I found my mother burning alive. I'll never forget her face as she sent me away. Charles Lee is responsible for her death by your order. And you're sorry. It's impossible. I gave no such order. I spoke the opposite, in fact. I told them to give up the search for the precursor site. We were to focus on more practical pursuit. It is done. And I'm all out of forgiveness. Which we know works from Connor's inner monologue as he attempts to do everything he can to save his father from the same fate as the other Templars. You've met your father, haven't you? I do not claim to trust the man or even like him. But I would be remiss to ignore this opportunity. Hatham may listen, but will he understand? And even if he does, Will he agree? Even he must admit that we can achieve more together than we do alone. I assume you're off to find him. Yes. Connor hadn't forgiven Hatham yet, but was open to learning the full picture of what happened. 
In the pursuit of Benjamin Church, we see flashes of the Hathamin Rogue as his ferocity bubbles to the surface, ramming the Aquila into the side of Church's ship, which reminded me a lot of the way he dealt with Adewale and Achilles in similarly dramatic fashion. We do get a nice moment after Benjamin Church is killed, where Hatham congratulates Connor and reassures him that he did the right thing. In contrast with every other main target so far, this is the first time Connor has felt confident in his decision. Achilles would often scorn him for his approach, and the targets would talk down to him in the memory corridors, so it makes this moment more impactful that Hatham casually gives him praise without realising how much that means to his son. This is where Hatham takes the opportunity to oust Washington as the man behind the attack on Connor's village. And what's this? Private correspondent. Oh, of course it is. Would you like to know what it says, Connor? It seems your good friend here has just ordered an attack on your village. Although attack might be putting it mildly. Well, tell him, Commander. We've been receiving reports of Allied natives working with the British. I've asked my men to put a stop to it. By burning their villages and salting the land, by calling for their extermination, according to this letter. Not the first time, either. Tell them what you did 14 years ago. That was another time. The Seven Years' War. And so now you see what happens to this great man when under duress. He makes excuses, displaces blame, does a great many things, in fact, except take responsibility! No! This backfires, however, as Connor lashes out and cuts off all ties between them. Hatham was banking on this being the chance to make amends but holding on to other information without telling him just exposes further his scheming Templar mindset. I do think this interaction is incredibly rushed, seeing as the mission prior started with Connor fully willing to look past his father's flaws, to try and find a happy medium that would end the war, but now has cut off all ties to try and make that happen. Three years later, Hatham and Connor haven't made contact with each other again, Connor is too focused on stopping Charles Lee, whilst Hatham contemplates how Charles ended up like this, and whether it shows badly on him that his rage has festered for so long. In Forsaken, we're treated to a scene between Charles and Hatham before the attack on Fort George, in which they argue about how each of them is to blame for their situation, and the deaths of the other Templars. But Hatham wants to be remembered as a good Grand Master, and insists that Charles leave so that Hatham can stay behind to confront Connor alone. After so long, it's fair to say that any hope of an alliance had faded, however the book and game differ greatly in their portrayal of the final fight between Connor and Hatham. In the game, Connor is injured from the cannon fire and stumbles into the fort desperately searching for Charles, before Hatham sneaks up on him for a cheap shot. It's pretty clear that Connor has the upper hand, Hatham has some dialogue about how Charles Lee is the future shepherd of the people, and that he hasn't given up on their cause just yet. This version of Hatham is out for blood from the start, and convinced he could beat Connor, that he was confident and capable of defeating him against the odds. He's also a lot more frustrated. Whilst Hatham was patient with Connor in the hopes he would click on eventually and side against Washington, Connor's obedience towards Washington to the point where he worked with him afterwards has caused Hatham to be infuriated that he hadn't gotten a similar apology for doing far less in his eyes. Their fight ends with a cannonball landing in between them and rendering them both severely injured. Connor crawls towards Hatham, acting like he has the upper hand, before Hatham starts to strangle him, giving Connor a clear opening to stab him in the neck with his hidden blade. Before we discuss the memory corridor, let's talk about how the novel handles this, because in my opinion, it's a hell of a lot better. Firstly, the two meet inside a corridor on the way to Hatham's quarters, inside the fort, which makes more sense than Connor just shouting in the middle of the open. Also, Hatham is more respectful of Connor, and despite the chaos around them, he draws his sword and hides an arm behind his back, in a gentlemanly fashion, making their fight on equal terms, and more of a duel. In his son, he sees the man he should have been, and treats him with the same respect his father would have given him. During the duel, 
Connor remarks that Hatham looks incredibly old by this point, but notably less skilled. Although he can see how skilled Hatham would have been as a younger man, there's less of a delusion and more of an intent with Hatham's actions. As they fight, it's clear that neither wants to kill the other. Connor remarks that he would have wanted nothing more than for both men to stop and walk away, but now that was impossible. A cannonball still strikes the pair of them, but this time Hatham is sent through a wall and left helpless on the ground. This is where Connor approaches him and gives him one last attempt to let him live, which makes a lot more sense than when he was crawling towards Hatham saying the same thing. In this version, Hatham's guards appear to kill Connor as Hatham gets to his feet before Connor's snipers take out the guards and allow Connor a moment to jump Hatham and stab him in the heart. There's no strangling or rambling in Forsaken. Hatham sticks to his character and plays by the rules, but also respects his son a lot more, and you can view this version as more of a suicide mission he knew he'd never come out alive from. The game, however, makes this more cinematic, but also more stupid in the process. The moment where Hatham strangles Connor, to me, is meant to be the final nail in the coffin that Hatham was as bad as Charles. Charles strangled Connor as a child, and it's only when his father does the same that Connor can no longer forgive him. Now, some people have said that Hatham was giving Connor a chance to kill him by leaving his arms open, and that if he wanted to, he would have stabbed him there and then. Now, I do think that's great, and more in line with the book's portrayal of Hatham, but unfortunately, I just don't think that's what's happening. At the beginning of the fight, in both the book and game, Connor attacks Hatham's forearm, and it's made a big deal out of that that is the weak spot by dislodging his hidden blade. Now, I can't remember if Hatham had two hidden blades explicitly in the book, but I'm going to go with the logic that he only had one, the one that was dislodged from Miko's arm when he fell. After all, he didn't take both of them. This means that Connor had damaged Hatham's hidden blade. It's even mentioned that Connor kicks away his sword so that he has no other options. In the game, he has two blades explicitly, so this logic doesn't hold up, and it does make me question how much of the book to consider, because they are two different characters. Book Hatham loves his son to the end. Game Hatham switches to loving Charles to the end. In Hatham's confession scene, he opens up to Connor about how he's proud to see his traits carry across to his son. He then says that he should have killed him a long time ago. I think this implies that Hatham was waiting to see the kind of man his son had become, whether Hatham should have been proud of him or not, and by saying this final line, I should have killed you long ago. I think it implies that Hatham had always known that Connor was a great son, and he just needed an excuse not to kill him long enough that he could spend some time with him. Connor leaves to find his father's journal, and learns what Hatham truly felt about him, which is posed as the novel itself, with Connor then taking over as a narrator to go off and kill Charles and conclude the story. He never liked his father, but he now understood the man that he was, and will take the lessons his journal left for him going forward, as he strives never to stop and ensure that there is peace, no matter what. Just north of here is where we normally unload the cargo. Maybe you'll find him there. No. Hatham's story is so close to perfection, he's by far the most layered, interesting, and complex character the series has ever produced in its villains, and he may only appear in five sequences of a 12-sequence game and two sequences of Rogue, but his story is so well executed that he ends up overshadowing Connor in his own game because of the charismatic performance and the fantastic writing to complement it. I do have my issues with the execution of his character in the game, where his final fight is very lacklustre as he falls into being just a plain old villain, but it is brought back by a memory corridor that wraps up his story in a way that leans into Hatham's colder but more witty persona. I also believe we should have seen Hatham and Zeo's relationship break down, or have some more explanation as to what happened, 
as it appears like the relationship in sequence 3 is quite rushed, and there's no reason given for why they separated. The book does a good enough job of explaining it by making their relationship feel a lot smaller and briefer than the game makes it out to be with the time skip, and the fact they never say what age Hatham left, and I only found out from reading the book for this video that they were only together for a few weeks. We desperately needed one more cutscene to give us an idea of the time frame. I also think that Connor snaps a bit too quickly and cuts ties with his father a bit abruptly. You get the impression that Connor is coming around to the idea of letting Hatham into his life, but when Hatham helps him in a meaningful way by shedding a light on what happened to Zeo, he gets pushed away from it, and that never made sense to me. Do I think Hatham should have gotten his own game? It would make a lot of sense to. Look at AC Mirage as an example of a game that took a character from Valhalla and did a deep dive into that character, isolated from the rest of the cast. A Hatham Kenway game showcasing his time with Shea in a more meaningful way would have been incredible. Shea was like the son Hatham never had. He got to spend time with him and enjoyed his company, trusting him on a mission of his own and needing to send him away. This kind of story parallels well with the actual son Hatham has that he won't go to see. There's a shamefulness in the character that should have been explored or a chance to see Hatham during the gap that was left in AC3's time skip. This character was so rich in potential. Look at the amount of fan art with him and Shea alone, or the numerous fan fictions that detail their time together and how it affects Shea and Connor's story. The web that is the New World Saga is so tightly constructed yet leaves gaps to be explored. Unfortunately, I believe that for the time being, we've seen the end of Hatham's appearances. However, with Connor's appearance as a character in the Assassin's Creed Nexus VR game, you just never know when your favourite character could make their return. What do you think of Hatham Kenway? Let me know down below, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time when we look at the latest Assassin's Creed protagonist with Basim.